Well, uh, great. Thank you to uh, the moderators and the uh, uh, sages for the opportunity to talk today. My name is Ariel Perez. I'm going to go over peristomal hernia repair. Is the treatment worse than the disease? I have no disclosures. First, we'll be going over a little bit of background about peristomal hernias, then we'll go into preventing uh, peristomal hernias, and the problems with the disease, the treatments of the disease, and problems with the treatments, and then a little bit of concluding thoughts. So most of us have probably had one or two or maybe a lot of patients stroll into our clinic with this bulge around the ostomy. We know that peristomal hernia is really just an incisional hernia related to an abdominal wall stoma. And there's over 100,000 new colostomies and ileostomies that are created every year. And the incidence of peristomal hernias uh, range from 28% for end ileostomy and up to 48% for end colostomy. And 76% of patients with peristomal hernias will end up develop symptoms related to their hernia, including pain, difficulty in proper pouching, leakage, skin irritation, obstruction, and bowel strangulation. Now, even with surgical treatment, the morbidity after peristomal hernia repairs is actually fairly quite high, 60%. Um, recurrence rates for peristomal hernias after uh, repairs, still quite high, 76% after primary repair and 86% after relocation. And when we think about ostomies, really when we make a stoma, it requires creation of a hernia. When you look at these types of ostomies, end colostomy, loop colostomy, loop ileostomy, it all requires a hole through the fascia where bowel goes through fairly similar to what we consider to be a hernia. And when we repair a peristomal hernia, it necessitates us leaving a hernia in place. So risk factors for developing a peristomal hernia are also very quite similar to other incisional and ventral hernias. But oftentimes when we're making an ostomy, um, a lot of these risk factors can't be optimized. Um, it tends to be some sort of cancer surgery and needs to be done fairly quickly. Well, is there a way to prevent developing a peristomal hernia? There's been a few different surgical techniques that have been brought up. One of them is just in terms of where you place the bowel going through the rectus muscle, whether it's going to be transrectus or lateral to the rectus abdominis. And in 20, uh, 2016, randomized control trial looking at 30 loop ileostomy patients, they found that there was no difference in peristomal hernias at the time when they uh, reversed the ostomy. And the 2018 European Hernia Society guidelines, as well as the 2019 Cochrane Review, showed that there was no good evidence to support or refute either of these techniques. And most recently, there was a 2020 um, single surgeon case series of 106 end colostomy patients um, where they performed a lateral positioning of the ostomy to the rectus. And they actually had fairly decent outcomes, 6% at one year, 10% at two years, and 17% at three years. But still, these are fairly small case series and no big randomized control trials. So there's really insufficient evidence to say what's going to be better for that technique. Then the other technique is using a transperitoneal or an extraperitoneal placement of the bowel. And there was a 2016 systematic review, um, and it found that extraperitoneal route actually had a lower rate of peristomal hernia repairs. But there was only one randomized control trial out of the 10 studies that they looked at. And then in a 2017 retrospective review looking at just 59 patients, again, they found that the um, peristomal hernia rate with the extraperitoneal route was also much lower, and there were no difference in complications. So small studies, only one randomized control trial in 2018, the European Hernia Society guidelines said it warrants further investigation and really there's insufficient evidence to say if that uh, technique is better one way or the other. Well, what about the type of fascial incision that you use when you create the ostomy? Um, in the most recent uh, published uh, randomized control trial for the uh, stoma consta A, looking at cruciate and circular fascial um, incisions, um, they actually found that there's no statistically significant difference in either unadjusted or adjusted analyses when you looked at cruciate or circular incision. But it should be noted that it was powered to show a 20% difference. So the relative risk was actually 1.25. And so when you look at the crude data, the cruciate incision, their peristomal hernia rate after one year was 50%, and the circular um, fascial incision was 37% uh, after one year. But again, based on their study and based on what they powered, they said that there was no difference. Now, stoma aperture, um, 
the European Hernia Society guidelines said that the trophene should be made as small as possible, but without causing ischemia. And that's mainly based on using the law of Laplace. So when you think about the tensions on the walls of the cylinder, is dependent on the pressure of its contents and its radius, such that the trophene is stretched open by tangential forces working on the circumference of the opening. It kind of makes sense. You want to make a smaller hole for the bowel to go through. And then in a retrospective review by Hong in uh, 2013, what he found that an aperture greater than three centimeters actually had a higher rate of peristomal hernia formation. As well, in uh, this 2010 study by Pilgrim, um, they found that for every one millimeter increase in aperture diameter, there was a risk of potential um, herniation increase at of 10%. So actually, making the stomatrophene as small as possible is really vital, and you want to make sure that you don't make it too small and you don't cause ischemia. Well, what about mesh augmentation? This is something that's been talked a lot about recently, where we place mesh in, during a permanent colostomy um, creation. Should it decrease peristomal hernias? In 2015, the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons made it a strong recommendation. In 2018, the European Hernia Society said it was a strong recommendation. And in 2018, a Cochrane Review study said it was safe and feasible and actually showed a reduction in peristomal hernia formation. But there's actually some new data coming out. There's been no difference in outcomes in the 2019 stoma mesh and the 2021 stoma constant A uh, randomized control trials. Both of those trials showed that there was no difference in one-year peristomal hernia rates after elective end colostomies with sublay polypropylene mesh. Now, this was only after one year of results. Who knows what it could be after two and three years? So with the different techniques, it really looks like the size of the aperture is really one of the main ways you can help prevent the occurrence of a peristomal hernia. Well, what are the problems when you develop a peristomal hernia? Why should we operate? Well, there's the reduced quality of life. There's reduced psychological well-being. You can have an enlarging hernia. It can cause pain, which is usually the most common reason for uh, fixing a peristomal hernia. It can also cause anxiety on the patient for an impending emergency. It can cause difficulty pouching, leakage, skin irritation, increased uh, supply costs because you have to change your bag so much, as well as obstruction and strangulation. But for most issues, Usually you can probably do an elective repair or maybe even try watchful waiting, but for obstruction and strangulation, you're really thinking about an urgent or emergent operation. So how do we treat this disease? Well, watchful waiting is one way you can do it. If you have patients in clinic and you see this little peristomal bulge, you get a CT scan and you can take a look and is it just a little bit of fat or redundant bowel that's going through there or is there actually bowel that's herniating through? Maybe you might want to try doing a little watchful waiting. You can try having the patient get an ostomy belt um, and see if that helps to reduce the contents and um, alleviate the symptoms. But there's also surgical repair, and that's mostly what patients end up coming to see us for. The problem is there's really a paucity of high-quality data. Um, it, it, it's difficult to tease out patient comorbidities, the disease processes, the types of stomas that they're repairing, the techniques of the repair, the type of mesh, the location of mesh, the hernia size, and how long the follow-up is actually done. Um, so there's multiple different ways that you can actually surgically repair an ostomy. First one, you can reverse the stoma, and really I think this is ideal if you can possibly do it. It means that you're not going to leave a stoma behind, so there's no risk of having a recurrent peristomal hernia. But it's not exactly possible for all patients, and still you have a risk of having an incisional hernia when you reverse the ostomy. There's also stoma relocation that can be done. It's good for patients who have an ostomy that they don't like in terms of it's difficult, uh, difficult to, with pouching because it's in the wrong location, or there's poor uh, ostomy budding. And in studies, it's actually been shown that uh, stoma relocation has fairly good results compared to a primary repair, 33% versus 76%. I'd argue that's still not very good. Um, and then the cons about doing that is that now you're going to have three different incisions where you can develop future hernias. Um, and in this uh, study uh, by Rubin in 1994, there was a 52% um, of patients who developed midline incisional hernias. And if you are going to consider this, you might want to consider moving the patient's ostomy to the contralateral side of the abdomen. The other thing is doing a primary fascial repair. The pros about this is it tends to be least invasive. You can do it um, with or without a laparotomy. It's quick and easy, and it's good on uh, suboptimal patients um, as a temporary repair or where mesh is contraindicated. The difficulty with it is, is that tissues are going to be under high intention, and there's also abysmal recurrence rates, up to 76%. Well, we know that mesh helps 
to reduce the chance of hernia recurrence in incisional hernias. This can also be done with peristomal hernias. We know that mesh can be placed in an onlay, a sublay, as well as an intraperitoneal placement. And mesh can be placed in as, as an open surgery as well as a minimally invasive surgery. And so if we think about mesh, what's the mesh that we should be using? Well, data on this is still variable and kind of heter uh, heterogeneous. And 2018 uh, European Hernia Society guidelines, they made no recommendation on the type of mesh, but they did say that synthetic, uncoated meshes are generally not considered for intraperitoneal use. And when you look at data on the different types of meshes, uh, it seems like synthetic is the most studied and has the lowest cost. Absorbable synthetic seems to be a higher cost and really has very minimal, if any, evidence in peristomal hernias. And then biologic is high cost with a high recurrence up to 90% in one study. So when we look at mesh repair, usually we think about two different types of mesh repair, the keyhole mesh where the bowel goes directly through the mesh, as well as the sugar baker repair where the bowel goes around and then on top of the mesh. Both of these repairs require the bowel be right next to the mesh, as well as both are susceptible to mesh contraction. There's also different uh, modifications and different variations on mesh. There's a Dyna mesh, which you can buy as a funneled mesh from the uh, industry. There's a sandwich repair, which is a keyhole repair, and then a sugar baker with two meshes. Um, and then there's a top hat modification, where you actually add uh, a little circular disc of mesh around uh, the keyhole site. Um, but when we think about mesh, there's an onlay repair, and this is a uh, fairly uh, an easy one. It can avoid a laparotomy, and it's been shown to have reasonable wound and mesh infection rates. The difficulty with it is that it requires skin flaps, but oftentimes the peristomal hernia has actually dissected that skin flap out for you already. Um, in a systematic review of seven case series, um, there is about a 17% recurrence rate. So still not great, but maybe actually a little bit better than before. Um, when we look at eye palm meshes, um, these can be done with either a keyhole or a sugar baker technique. It can be done open, laparoscopic, or robotic. And depending on the surgical technique, you can have reasonable recurrence rates, 2.1% in one study, but it can be as high as 44% in another study. Um, cons of this is that there is possibility of mesh erosion and intra-abdominal adhesions. And if we think about um, uh, eye palm uh, mesh repairs, we can't forget about robotic peristomal hernia repairs as well. There's not a lot of data on this. Um, but thank you, Dr. Augenstein. And <laughs> this is uh, the largest published case series uh, in 2021 20, uh, that was published by uh, um, out of uh, the Carolinas. This is a case series of 15 robotic sugar baker peristomal hernia repairs. They were able to achieve fascial closure, and they used a dual-coated PTFE mesh and used tax. Um, after a mean follow-up of uh, 14 months, they actually had fairly good um, outcomes. There were no wound complications and just one hernia recurrence. The only other two paris, uh, robotic uh, peristomal um, series were fairly small. There was a three uh, patient case series with biologic mesh and a two patient case series with uh, a retrorectus uh, keyhole peristomal hernia, uh, both of them without any recurrences after their follow-up. Um, and in terms of IPOM meshes, again, it's, there's no standardized high quality evidence to directly compare the type of ostomy, the operative approach, the technique, or the mesh type. But when you look specifically at open versus laparoscopic, looking at the NISQIP data, they found that laparoscopy had shorter OR times, a shorter length of stay, a reduction in surgical site infections, and a reduction in 30-day overall morbidity. And when you look at keyhole versus sugar baker, in two separate systematic reviews, um, both of them showed that a laparoscopic sugar baker had, la um, had a lower recurrence rate than a laparoscopic keyhole repair. What about a retromuscular mesh placement? This involves placing mesh between the rectus muscle and posterior rectus sheath. It can be done with either a keyhole or a sugar baker technique, and it can be done with a laparotomy or a peristomal incision or, either, or even an MIS technique. It can be combined with a component separation for larger hernia defects. Um, the pros of this is it avoids intraperitoneal mesh to limit mesh erosion adhesions, and fistula formation. It's useful for addressing uh, concomitant ventral hernias, and it has reasonable recurrence rates, 6.9% uh, in a pooled data from a 3K series. Cons is that you still have mesh right up against bowel, so there is a possibility of mesh erosion, and it can be difficult if uh, you, um, uh, it can be a difficult technique if you combine it with a component separation. So with so many repairs, there likely isn't a best option. So what's the risk of repair? Well, there's a risk of recurrence, 
a risk of infection, risk of mesh complications, and a risk of stoma complications. And so in this uh, 2015 study, um, uh, which is a multi-center analysis of patients undergoing elective ventral hernia repairs, um, Holohan um, and their group um, brought up the idea of the vicious cycle of complications. Now this was for ventral hernia repairs, not for, specifically for peristomals, but what they found was that patients with multiple hernia repairs are more likely to require subsequent reoperations, have longer operative durations, develop infections, and develop a hernia recurrence. So maybe it might be better for us to avoid a peristomal hernia repair, and then we can avoid entering into this vicious cycle of complications. Um, as well, in this uh, uh, 2016 study um, by Kokotovich, what they looked at was uh, over 3,000 patients in the Danish National Patient Registry looking at elective incisional hernia repairs. Again, this was ventral hernias, uh, not specifically looking at peristomals, but they found that the risk of all mesh-related complications requiring subsequent surgery and reoperation for hernia recurrence increased over time. So maybe it's actually better to avoid peristomal hernia repair and avoid developing a mesh-related complication for our patients. When we look at um, peristomal hernia repairs and we look at when we use mesh, here in this um, uh, systematic review, looking specifically at just on-lay mesh, we can see that there's a high risk of recurrence, up to 60% in one study. Um, there's high risk of infection and there's also a possibility of mesh erosion into the bowel. If we look at an eye palm repair, uh, again, there's still a high risk of recurrence, up to 28%, or there's a risk of infection. In this case series, they, they didn't find any um, any evidence of uh, mesh erosions in, in this systematic review. And then in laparoscopic repair, again, high rates of recurrence, up to 46%, um, risk of infection, as well as mesh erosion. And then when we look at retromuscular sublay meshes, again, high risk of recurrence, over 40%, risk of infections, as well as risk of mesh, uh, mesh erosion. This can all bring you back into that vicious cycle of hernia complications. So let's look at just this one case series. It's a 38 patient, single center series, using an open poly peristomal hernia repair. And actually fairly good results. 13% wound morbidity, 11% recurrence rates after a mean follow-up of 13 months. Well. Sorry? When you see a patient like that, I'm fairly certain that that patient did not think that that treatment was better than the disease. So after four months doing okay, they ended up with mesh erosion and ostomy ischemia. And actually in this case series, there are three mesh erosions leading to stoma necrosis, bowel obstruction, and or perforation, which required op reoperation. So although there were actually pretty decent outcomes, the complications can be very, very detrimental to a patient's quality of life. So in a 2021 study of a 20 patient case series, we, we found that there's 60% complication rate, and then this other 2021 um, case series looking at 235 peristomal hernias, they found that there were six patients with fistulas that developed, one patient with an ostomy stricture, and they found that one-fifth of all patients underwent a reoperation after their initial peristomal hernia repair. In this 21, uh, 2021 series with a single center looking at 38 patients undergoing 59 recurrent peristomal hernias, they found that the median number of peristomal hernia repairs per patient was two. And over 50% developed a post-operative complication and almost 50% developed a hernia recurrence. So what would be nice is actually this study. The study that was proposed by Blackwell and Pinckney in 2020 looking at patient-reported outcomes of peristomal hernia treatments. It's a current ongoing study to examine patient quality of life with both surgery and watchful waiting. So, you know, as for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it probably doesn't exist with peristomal hernias. In conclusion, incidence of peristomal uh, stomal hernias and likelihood of developing symptoms is fairly high. Prevention is the key. The smallest aperture possible is best, and prophylactic mesh may help in the long run. With surgical repair, you'd ideally like to optimize the patient before elective repair. You want to avoid primary repair in elective situations. There's no high-quality data for mesh recommendations. There's no high-quality data for surgical methods, but use of mesh does reduce recurrence, and with MIS technique, sugar baker does seem to have a lower recurrence than a keyhole technique. And with surgical repair, there really is no good outcome. So is the treatment worse than the disease? It's, it's relative. The treatment may be worse than the disease for some. For others, the treatment may be better. 
but a thorough discussion of risks and benefits should be had between the patient and the surgeon with peristomal hernias. Thank you.